Hey, everybody, everybody, you with your main man, Anthony Brogdon, today. Oh, my God, man, let me tell you something. I got a heavy hit on the channel. Now, hold on, let me say this. Let me say this. And I got to, I got to preface it this way. I love all my guests. I, I ain't going to put no guests on top of, or, or better than any other guests. But the guy I got on the channel today, I'm super excited. He's come on. Now, hold on. Let me say this, though. I'm super excited about the rest of them, too. But this brother right here, man, when you hear this story, you're going to understand what I, man, this guy comes from royalty. It, it, uh, royalty, a uh, uh, black history, royalty, American history in America world known, all that stuff. Boom, shaka laka. I'm super excited he's come on the channel. Man, Strong Inspirations has left the station. We jamming that people like this decide to say, okay, I'll take some time to come on here and let you do what you do and let me tell my story. For you, my guest, for you and me, because I learned a lot. I have been enlightened by doing this. Did you see the video I got of the lady out of Australia? I didn't know Australia was a black continent till them waste folks, the mother folks came in and invaded. Did not know that. Didn't know was that many blacks over there. I've heard terms, but did not know she enlightened. Did you watch that one? Did you watch the one where the lady says that she lives in Clinton, uh, 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 Arkansas, I think it is. And she, her life's mission is to talk about the Clinton massacre. Had you heard of that one? Pretty devastating. They were just mad at them black folks because they wanted to learn how to vote. And you know who they was voting for? People who felt like them. And the racists got mad at them and killed 300 of them. Didn't want them to vote. Watch that one. It's the Clinton massacre. You've heard of the Elaine massacre. Oh, no, no. You ain't heard of the Elaine massacre? I got the lady on the channel. Her great, great uncle was killed in that time in, the, in Elaine, Arkansas. Pretty devastating. Tulsa wasn't the only one. Yeah. How about this one, my friends? I got the great, great granddaughters of a black guy who was enslaved. He got his freedom. My man is so talented, so smart. He opened up a car manufacturing company. He was competing against Ford. Called C.H. Patterson. Watch that video. Did you see the video I got on the channel with Madam C.J. Walker's great-great-granddaughter? Oh, my God. Check it out. This is the one thing that I didn't, under didn't know. She only operated that business 13 years before she passed. So in 13 years, she started out at the age of 38. She died at 51. How many years is that? I think my math is pretty decent. That's 13 years. She did all that in 13 years. She's on the channel. Did you see the one? About, I got one more for y'all. You, you see how many? I got 190 videos up there. Uh, check it out. Did you, uh, you've heard of Juneteenth and how we are celebrating Juneteenth? I got a guy on the channel that says Juneteenth was not the end of slavery. It was not the end of slavery. There was still a few more states that still celebrated that, still recognized that. Or oh, how about this one? Did you see the lady? I got a couple of these on the channel where they talk about not Juneteenth was the day of emancipation in their state. But it was the it was the eighth of August. Have you heard of that? The eighth of August, and they celebrated hard down in some of these areas in Tennessee, because the guy was the governor. Andrew Johnson was the governor. I get them Johnsons and Jacksons mixed up, but it was Johnson. He was the governor. He had slaves, right? He gonna run for president. He say, man, I, this ain't a good look. So he released his slaves on the eighth of August. They celebrate that now, 100 some years later. Strong inspirations. Come on now, hit the subscribe button on this channel.
hit the like button. Watch this on this video because my man going to knock you out. He got some stuff about his ancestor that I know you don't know. And, and check it out. And it come from the heart. He heard it firsthand through a couple people in the family, right? Like this video. If you don't like it, I'm going to keep giving you more, though. I'm going to get to you eventually. Hit the notifications bell, which means that when I put these videos up, and you know I'm doing four or five of them a week, I don't have no specific time. It come on my heart. I'll be like, sometimes I did one the other day. It was two o'clock in the morning. I couldn't sleep. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I know what's going to put me to sleep. I'm going to release some Black history on my people. And I put out the video. It's two in the morning. You want to get a ding. How about this? Tell somebody about strong history. Don't keep it to yourself. You running around here acting like you know everything. You up here and impressing these ladies, these ladies impressing these guys with all this black history and you got it on the channel. Don't want to tell somebody. Don't do that. You will be blessed, I suspect, <laughs> by telling somebody about strong inspirations. And now, you know, it's a couple more things we're going to do. I want you to watch my movie. I'm this serious. I put two years of my life in this film. It starts with and ends with a guy that was 101 years old. My man says, you can't tell me nothing. I done seen it all. Did you know slaves went to college? Did you know slaves owned businesses? It's in the movie. I talk about the rise of black business in America. It's streaming on Amazon. I'm getting to my guest real soon. He's smiling. I know it. He ready. Did I'm taking you, notes. Uh, no, I got this book out. I'm this serious. And it ain't no big book. It is not pricey. I get straight to the point, as I like to say, straight no chaser in my book too, on some of them similar notes that's in the movie, but more. I tell you all the ways slaves gained their freedom. Did you know there were some slaves that sued for it? And one, they heard some stuff and said, okay, we supposed to have equal rights. I wanna be equal and I'm gonna go to court found some people to represent them and won. How about this one? Did you hear about that lady that was walking around the South and chronicling all those lynchings and stuff like that? Have you heard of this lady, Ida B. Wells? That's her thing right there, right? It's in the book. I just give you one of the facts. Just tell you a little bit. And then I give you the link to where I found them. I don't write no commentary. I ain't trying to dilute it. My book is on my website. It's on Amazon too, but it's on my website, businessintheblack.net. Go there, my friends. A couple more things. I'm, I, I'm holding my man up just a second. A couple more things. Little old me, I'm having my own festival. I got a guy on my channel out of Quindaro, Kansas. Well, what happened was Missouri was a slave state and Kansas was free. It ain't but a little bit of river separating them two. The people in Missouri used to walk across the river when it froze. I, you know what I mean? I'm gonna be honest. It had to freeze, had to be winter time. They might even try to swim somehow, but get from Missouri to Kansas. And when they got to Kansas, they went to this town called Quindaro. Now they told that man, you come over here looking for me, I'm shooting back. I done had enough of you, sir. I want my own way of life. And the guy I interviewed, his great great grandfather, did that. And when he got there, he owned, a, he opened up a business and became successful in this town. Well, see what happened was when I read, when I was listening to the story, I said, "Dang, man, I, I got to go check this place out." Got me to thinking. I'm having my own festival May 27th to 29th in Quindaro. So come on down. I can only take a thousand, y'all, because I want to be able to organize it right and handle this thing. You got people going to greet you at the airport. They're going to greet you at the hotel. I'm going to feed you the whole weekend. It's a nominal fee, very nominal. Check it out. Go to my website, businessintheblack.net. Now, you hear me use this term strong a lot. Strong is my favorite word. I can't, I've been saying strong for about the last 25 years. Somebody said, come up with a brand word. I came up with strong. I, I wish I lived on Strong Street. I got a license plate to say strong. 
Strong is, is and, and let me tell you what this means. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that's my introduction to my guest today. He's a strong brother. That's what I heard. That's what I believe. Him and I have had some conversations, and that's the impression I got. Come on, uh, introduce yourself. Let's get it on. Thank you. Oh, man. Well, hey, Mr. Strong. Strong. There you go. <laughs> All right. Brother, I appreciate you having me on your show, man. I, I, I am honored. And like you said at the beginning, there ain't nobody better than anybody else. Ain't nobody worse than anybody else. There you go. So I'm, I'm equally excited to be on, on, on your show as you are to have me. Thank you. Now tell uh, us your name. Tell us your name. Yeah, so Dan Duster, um, the uh, one of the uh, great grandchildren of Ida B. Wells. Oh, I told y'all everybody. Yeah. Now, now uh, how many greats are you away? Oh, uh, just one. It's my father's grandmother. Really? Mm -hmm. So, so, but you never met her. No, 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 no. She, she died in 1931. My father never met her. She died in 1931. My father was born in 32. Oh, now hold on. Okay. Now, if that's his, if that's, that's his mother. That's his, his, his mother's mother. His mother's mother. Okay. I got you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I got you. And, and so uh, if I ask a couple questions on yourself, uh, let me get to this one here. How about this? How does it feel knowing that, that that's your, you know, in your lineage? Oh, man, it, it feels better every year. As a growing up, we really didn't talk about it. It, it was not out of shame. It was just out of uh, what. So what I had told her children was, hey, be, be your own selves. Don't don't ride my legacy. And so that's what my grandmother, Alfreda, told her children. That's what, what we learned. So it wasn't until um, high school, college and really after college that I started to fully appreciate what she did and being a descendant of her. So. The older I get, the, the more proud I am and the, the more humble I am at the same time is that she did so many incredible things um, and I, I got a lot more to do to compare with her. No, no, but but let me ask you this. Okay, no, if she told them that, does that, does that lessen the effect of how y'all can be greater knowing that you got that, I don't know, let's not call it pressure, but that in your blood, do you wish that you would have said, hey, hold on now, you got to be doing some things. No, so my sister and I talk quite a bit. She's written a few books on Ida and, and does speeches on her and so forth. And that the way we grew up, um, my so my father comes from a rich history from Ida and so forth, but my mom's family comes from a rich history on her side from a farm community called Pelham, Texas. Okay. Um, the three brothers uh, founded Pelham, Texas. And it was a black farm community. And so them together raised us. And so we got our, our values from both of them. Some of them were distinctly from Ida, but some were distinctly from my mom. But my last name being Duster in Chicago, um, I had far more expectations as that. Um, and so the, the, the lineage is Ida had four children, the youngest one being Alfreda. Alfreda uh, married Ben Duster. They had five children, the middle one being Donald. And then uh, Donald had three children, and I, one of them being Daniel. Okay. So Alfreda's kids, my, my father's... Um, and his siblings all went to a high school on the South side called Phillips. And they graduated either valedictorian or salutatorian because education was paramount in our family. Oh, and they stayed, they stayed in Chicago and then their wives were school teachers and so forth. My uncle was a lawyer. My father was an architect. My father, uh, my, my other uncle was an architect. My father um, was in business and then uh, ran a community program, uh, community-based organization for years. And so the name Duster, we went to more, some of the more popular high schools in the South Side. So if you were a Duster in Chicago, we were related. I got you. So there was pressure you. there. So if we were throwing snowballs or acting stupid, it's like, you can't do that. I'm telling your mom. And it may have been my aunt, but somebody was going to find out. <laughs> I got you. I, okay, I love it. Now, let me, let me say this. When I, when, I, when I did the interview with uh, Ida B. Wells, uh, uh, Alicia Bundles, uh, and she said that their parents did the same thing, but it, it, uh, I think she said her great grandfather committed suicide hmm. so as a, a result a of the hmm. pressure living under that title, right? So, CJ Walker's um descendant bundles, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, I, I don't know what my question is there, but I'm just saying, would that, yeah, I mean, so people, I, I, I'm you know, I don't know, you know, if I if they brought if if. if they made being Ida B. Wells descendant a bigger deal if that would have affected me. Um, I appreciate what they, the, the way my family, again, and as far as I know, all of 
um, Alfreda's uh, descendants didn't have the, the, the pressure uh, or obligation of being a descendant of Ida B. Wells. Um, so like I said, I, I, I appreciate that. Like I said, as an adult, I choose to yeah. affiliate strongly with that legacy. Okay. But as, as a child growing up, I, yeah, we, we were encouraged to be independent. So the kids didn't know y'all that was the story. The, your, your no, no, not, in so not the kids. Some of the teachers knew and some of my neighbors knew. And so we, we got held to a higher standard to that degree because of that, but also because my mom knew all my teachers. So yeah, like so okay. it was I that you. relationship I got of you. both parents. Now, now how did how did y'all get to Chicago? Was she in Chicago? Ida B. Yeah. Wells, or did she pass it? What's the Chicago? Yeah, 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 yeah. So she's born in Holly Springs, Mississippi, which is about 30 miles south of Memphis, Tennessee, um, and has a, uh, a paper there, but then moved to Memphis um, in the early 1880s to become a school teacher or to continue being a school teacher um, and was uh, there in 1889. Well, I was there for a while, but I uh, was a school teacher there and wrote an article. She did freelance journalism. So wrote an article in the newspaper talking about uh, the, the disparities between the white schools and the black schools. And the white schools had proper funding, adequate class sizes and proper resources. And the black schools were overcrowded, underfunded and didn't have the proper resources. What's Unfortunately, you could literally read that article today and ain't much changed. Yeah. Um, but so she was there, um, was there until 19, 1892, um, really 1893, when um, she wrote an article. So we're talking about the lynching investigations. So she published um, an article about that. And the, uh, actually the, our family feels that she was strategically out of town when that came out. There's an angry racist white mob went and destroyed her, her newspaper printing press and said that she ever returned, whoever returned, because they didn't know exactly it was her, but they, they said if she ever returned, they were going to lynch her too. So she went from Memphis and lived in New York for a little bit, came to Chicago for the World's Fair in 1893, um, met Ferdinand Barnett, um, went back and forth for a little bit, but eventually settled in Chicago, married Ferdinand Barnett who, again, was another phenomenal person that I wish got more recognition. He was a, a prominent civil rights attorney in okay. Chicago and had, was owner of uh, Chicago's first black newspaper, the, the Conservator. Okay, Let, let's go back a little bit little bit further for people who just don't have an idea. Is, is that her real name, Ida B. Wells? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, born the <coughs> oldest of eight children. Um, her father was uh, Jim Wells. Mother was uh, Lizzie Elizabeth. Um, and so uh, both of her parents, of course, were slaves. So she was born in 1863. So we, as you talked about, the official end of slavery right. um, at different time frames for, for different states, technically. Um, or so officially there was one time frame, but um, actually different states had different time frames. Sure. So, but as soon as slavery ended, um, her, her parents were about education. So they sent her. My mom went to school with her and the other kids until mom could read and write uh, appropriately. Um, and then, um, 1878, um, I had, you know, continued to be educated. Um, okay, let me fever. stop you right there though. Cause I like what you're saying, but how did they send her to get an education? Did they have a little wherewithal? I mean, they weren't, I mean, they were married at, were they married as slaves and that kind of thing? Yes. Oh, really? Mm hmm And so again, you had unofficial ceremonies. Um, but yes, that, that was, uh, Jim and, and again, you take on, um, so yeah, so they, they got married as slaves. And so her mom, which is another factor, um, was a slave from Virginia and her mom's family had been sold off into slavery. So her mom's siblings all got sold to different places. Right. And so um, her mom told Ida those stories and Ida was like, okay, yeah, family's important to me. So I want to keep it together. So going back to the incident in 1878, when yellow fever went throughout the South and killed both of her parents and one of her younger siblings. Some other family members, aunts and so forth, wanted to split up the families. Like, okay, well, two will go with this aunt, two will go with this one, one has special needs, they'll go with another one. And Ida was like, nah, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not splitting up my family. And, so, and hold on, hold on, let's, let's, let me get this point. I don't yeah. mean to interrupt you and be mean, but uh, so how old is she at this point? At 70, uh, do you 16. think? 16. So, so she, so somehow something was ingrained in her to be special, even at that point. 
uh, Brother Anthony. And so other things that, that she did as that her father had her do, not, not, not like um, King Richard Williams, um, the Serena uh, Venus's father, um, but you know, just certain things in her life prepared her for being the activist that she was. So when she was younger, because she could read and write me and most people couldn't, her father would have her read because most people couldn't read. So they'd have little events in the town with black people and she'd read, you know, the periodicals or read the news to the groups. So she got experience reading and public speaking at age 12, 13. I love it. Okay. And um, her father was active in the community and voted again, blacks could vote um, for, you know, during the period of reconstruction. Right. And so he was on a property and the property owner said, Hey, look, if you vote, I'm kicking you off of this property. So Jim was like, look, I'm voting. And so he voted and the property owner kicked him off the property. And Ida saw that. And she's like, wait a minute, you know, we've got the right to vote. We exercise the right to vote and our family gets kicked off the property. Where, where's their justice here? And so just those things in her life that, that was like, no, this, this just isn't right. I got um, you. Let me ask you this. Okay. You said that she learned how to read and write. Who taught her? There were schools? There, black, yeah, black schools. So, so after slavery, uh, there were schools for blacks. Yep. Uh, okay. And did, did her other sisters and brothers go to school also? Yeah. Yep. Did, did, did they, uh, in their own right, excel like she did in some regards? To my knowledge, I mean, <coughs> they, all, they, they were all educated Yeah, um, right. as far as excelling. Um, they all, you know, got jobs and so forth. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, yeah. sure. Okay, let me ask you this then. So now she's writing. <clears throat> did, did, did she stumble upon this? What I mean is she wrote that one article that you talked about earlier mm -hmm. and it got published. And then did she stumble upon and say, well, dang, I might be the only one writing this stuff. I'm going to keep going. How did, how did, what was the breakthrough for her to, 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 to take it to the next level, let's say? Sure. So the first breakthrough was the writing the article in the, in the newspaper. And again, she was a freelance journalist at that point doing it for free. And so she was, she was, her, her, her job was school teacher. And so that was 1889. So they didn't fire her immediately, but the next semester they didn't renew her contract. So she what had newspaper. Do you know um, that one article? I can't recall, but she then went to the Memphis free speech and negotiated getting part ownership and being the lead journalist for the Memphis free speech. Oh, okay. So that's when she officially became a journalist because she could no longer be a teacher. She transitioned to being a, a, an adjourned. Oh, I got you. Journalist. Now, what may, so, and she immediately begins because she grew up with her father and mother being involved in the community and, and politically aware. That's what she wrote about. I and got you. About the, which again, women in general, if they were journalists at all, they're going to write about the stereotypical things of women um, during, right. especially during that time. So I don't mean to be disrespectful, but during that time frame, it's right. like, hey, talk about gardening, talk about cooking, talk about right. those things. Don't talk about politics. Don't talk about other people. Don't talk about, you know, what's happening over here. And, and Ida immediately started writing about that. Now, the, her, I'd say the biggest event in her life that made her become a anti-lynching activist was she had three friends who were lynched, Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Will Stewart. And kind of like today, if you read something in the paper and somebody's accused of something, you, you may say, well, you know what? Maybe he didn't do that. He, he probably did something. You know, he didn't commit that crime, but he probably is a criminal. Okay, okay. And so, you know, when, when you look at media, especially the way they still portray Black men, I yeah, think that, sure. that, that's natural for people to do. And so she kind of did that as well. But though she had three friends who were lynched. Uh, they were co-store uh, co owners of a co-op grocery store called the People's So they were lynched together? Yeah. So what happened was oh, they're store owners and they had a, a racist white store owner across the way. And there was an incident that started with some kids, bottom line, some racist white men got involved um, and it escalated to, you know, fight between black men and white men. The white men got deputized and went to the people's grocery to destroy it. The black men took up, took arms in self-defense, ended up shooting a couple of them. Um, they rounded up as many as the black men as they could in that town and put them in jail. 
um, one of the white men who was shot, and there was a black militia there as well, so not getting too deep. But the black militia protected this, the, the jail for a few days until they found out that the wh white man who was shot was going to survive. At that point, they felt that the men would be safe. They left that night. Um, they went and got those three men, Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, Will Stewart, to, to a place called The Curve that's in Memphis. I've been there. It's probably been 15 years since I've been there, but it, really? it's, it's still got a cold, eerie feeling to it. What is it? So it's a, a place of undeveloped land by a railroad track, if I remember. Okay. Correctly. But um, yeah, so it's, it's called the curve and it, there, it is a curve. Um, and I'd say it's probably, I don't know, uh, maybe three, 400 yards total at least. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the men beg, beg for their lives. I mean, oh, Ida was so close to Thomas, she was godmother to his child. So I'm saying they, they, they were tight. Okay, yeah. He was good friends with his wife as well. And so she was out of town when it happened, but upon come, returning, she read the articles about it and was like, you know, three men lynched and pretty much like, you know, these thugs were conspiring to kill white people. And she's like, what? Like, these are my boys. These are upstanding men in the community. I so got you. We're going to write about them like this and, you know, vify them like this. Then what about all these other people have been lynched? So she, that's when she started becoming an investigative journalist, which she pretty much is. America's first investigative journalist. You literally went and interviewed people about lynchings. Um, sometimes the white women who were, you know, allegedly accused a black man of- uh, It's always that. Right. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, that's the dog whistle, you know. It, yeah, right. A, 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 any community wants to protect their, their women. Yeah, so, it's always over a white woman. He, on the elevator, he touched a white woman. And, mm -hmm. and that's the Tulsa story. To what happened, check it out. I, I, I had the showing of my movie in Tulsa. And the lady who introduced me, the guy who they accused of, uh, of of raping the white girl, was her great great uncle or something. Mm -hmm. They they got married. They was dating. Right, right. So she published that. And so in some instances, the white woman said it was consensual, and she published that in 1892. So you know that wasn't going to go over well. So um, that's. Let me, the, let me that's, ask you this: How yep. about this one? When you say she published it, she had her own paper, so she printed a paper. She had that article and other articles in the paper. So she did that as well as she wrote a book called The Red Record, which was specifically investigating uh, 200 plus lynchings that occurred in the South during that time frame. Oh. But, yeah. but, but what was the, the, the name of her paper was what again? The, the Memphis Free Speech. And, and how long did it operate, would you say? Oh, up until um, it was destroyed in uh, late 1892. So... After that, so again, you just talk about other things that we still need to have dialogue about and yeah. um, reparations. It's like, that was her business. It was destroyed. There was no insurance on that. So she had to go start new, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so, so oh, they, so they, so they uh, have you seen a, a picture of the uh, newspaper or is there a copy still around? Don't know that there's a copy. Of, so I, I've seen it via microfiche. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure. And most anything, because uh, a lot of people ask, do we have any artifacts or articles or anything from Ida? And my father's generation decided to, rather than have it with the family in somebody's basement or in somebody's mantle, they gave everything to the Regenstein Library, which is part of the University of Chicago. Okay. With the intent of literally the world can have access to it. Yeah, I love it. I got that's that's cool. That's cool. So yeah. now she's so it, to have a newspaper, and I, I wrote this in my book. She had to either have subscribers or advertisers as a way of making a means to afford the printing and whatever else she did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So st standard business model. Right. So, you know, you, you write the articles, you've got to add distrib distribution and you've got to have uh, people who are going to pay for, for advertising. Did, did, did At some point when the paper was running, did she have uh, that, you know, of like three, four people on the staff that helped uh, do different things? Oh, yeah. So she was um, co-owner and lead editor. But to my knowledge, she, she was not as involved in the daily activities. OK, so she, she she leveraged her ability to be a journalist, to become co-owner, but um, she didn't necessarily manage the day-to-day -day operation. I got you. And so did, did, so she traveled 
going to when a lynching happened and recorded that by talking to family members, other people. Yeah, family members. So the, you know the the accused or any witnesses that that may have been um, listed, and she would literally interview them and say what happened. Now, you know, the one thing that uh, might be a little difficult, and I, this is going to lead to my next question. Sure. This is a question that lead to a question. When people knew about that lynching thing, they was very hush-hush about it. They were very scared to talk about it. She had to do something special to get them to open up. Well, so white people weren't as hush-hush about it. So lynching, from my perspective, was America's first domestic terrorism. Yes. You know, when you look at the, 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 the transition from slavery, you didn't have much lynching during slavery because slaves were property. People didn't want to destroy their property. Right. They'll whip them and try and break your spirit, but they don't want to kill you because they paid money. So you end slavery. And then, you know, I, 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 I try and say this um, without sound, sounding sarcastic, but if you go from being in control and dominant and superior, to somebody one day or one year and then the next year or whatever it is four years now you're equal your mind is blown it's like wait a minute it's like you were a slave you 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 were beneath me and now you've got a store you're writing a newspaper you're being successful uh-uh this this isn't right this isn't the way way society is supposed to go and so um andrew young said this uh years ago uh former mayor of atlanta said that in the south as black people, you can get close, but you can't get big. In the North, you can get big, but you can't get close. So in the South, they'll live by you. That concept. Right? They'll, they'll live by you. Racist white people will, will, will live by you. And I mean this because, of course, there are wonderful, good white people out there. But racist white people are like, no, nah, you know, you you can live near me, but I don't want you to have more than I do. I don't want you to have as much. Definitely not more than I do. Yeah, I got you. Right. And so, um, and to, and again, to keep their power, it's like, well, how can we do this through voter suppression, right. through um, you not having businesses, through you not having proper resources, not having education, right? And being intimidated, intimidating you to do that. And the best way to do that is through fear. And so lynchings were intentionally public to instill fear to say, hey, look, if you step out of line, this may happen to you too. So, this, do you, so do you think, and and I, I, maybe you do. You just answered. She would interview white people to tell about the lynching. Absolutely, yes. Now I knew that, uh, and I got several people on the channel that said lynching was what, and a lot of black people might not know this. That that was a picnic for them. It was a spectacle. It it, it was, and I've I've heard that uh, picnic is derived from that pick pick a nigga. Yeah. Um, I, I don't right. I don't know the validity of that. But yes, it, it was, and it was, it was often an event. So sometimes it was spontaneous. Sometimes it was an event where they would literally say, hey, look, half price on bus fare going to the lynching on Saturday. Is that right? You'll see, you'll see pictures of families, like you said, like, um, like it's a carnival, or like it's a state fair. That's they right. At a lynching and looking at the body and, you, you know, families, literally girls and boys, four, five, six years old with, with their parents. Yeah, that's lunch. right. So now when she when she showed up to, to do these articles, was her paper just distributed in Memphis or did it actually get national distribution in some sort of respect? Yeah, so, the, so um, black papers at the time did have um, widespread distribution. They, they weren't all national per se, but they go to different states, right? I got you. They, they went to all 50 states um, or all 48 at that time. Um, but yes, they, they, they did have multi-state distribution. So now she's got this paper. Uh, uh, was there ever a threat on her life when she showed up or any of those type of scenarios? Immediately after she wrote that article, there was a threat on her life. They said, if she ever returns here, we will kill her. But so, even after that, she kept going. That was just the one article. Going. So she didn't return to the South for decades. So she stayed, she stayed North for, for decades and um it didn't return uh, so allegedly okay let me let me let me let me see if i got this right okay so she started her she she joined that newspaper at what year 1899 and that article came eight, out eight, what eight, year eight, 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 1889 1889 right and the article came out what year 1892 so that's 3 years let's say yep. but she kept going after that article oh absolutely yeah so like i said so she moved to new york um, worked with a guy there, T. Thomas Fortune, um, who 
was a, a very resourceful man and helped her out. And then came to Chicago and like I said, back and forth to Chicago, 1893, 1894, um, married Ferdinand Barnett and settled here. And then, um, so like I said, Ferdinand owned the conservator. And so supposedly um, he was courting her, pursuing her for a while and asked for her hand in marriage. And finally she was like, okay, but that's a yes. Uh, if I can have half of the conservator. And so she, part, part of her marriage was negotiating uh, being part owner of the conservator. So when, when, we, when we talk about her being an activist, mm -hmm. we, we, again, I'm trying to, how long was she an activist per se? Now you, cause you, you got me on this three year period of the newspaper, but there were more articles and things oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. that. So that, that was just one in... newspaper. She wrote, she wrote for a newspaper in New York. She wrote. wrote... I see what you say. Yeah. So she um, there's even another... if she didn't go to the South, she still wrote these articles. Oh yeah, absolutely. I absolutely. got you. I got you. Absolutely okay. yes. And again, so again, it wasn't necessarily national distribution, but the Conservator had distribution in the South. The Chicago Defender had distribution in the South, and both of those papers um, had large influence for the Great Migration because she would write articles in the early 1900s, 1910, saying, hey, look, I know what is bad in the South. It's not great here, but it's better. So y'all need to move from the South up North. So she, um, Abbott, um, a few other people, uh, prominent uh, uh, journalists or newspaper owners here in Chicago had heavy influence for people moving from the South because of the articles they wrote. Yeah, yeah. Did they did they look at her to to come and speak and and those type of things of, of per her articles? How what what was the claim to her fame then? I know it was the articles, but what else? Why do we know her so well? So yeah, the articles absolutely one um, and her speaking. So she traveled to Europe a couple of times to um, England and Scotland. So 1892, 1893, um, to bring light to the world on what was happening to the black man in the US. Because again, the US was founded on life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, yeah, I got freedom you. and justice for all. And so she take, because again, they, they'd have pictures of those lynchings. So she takes some of those pictures and say, look, this is what, what's happening to the Negro in America. And so in Memphis, they had lynchings, several lynchings a year after she went to Europe and, and talked about that. And uh, articles were written in European newspapers Memphis didn't have a lynching for like another 20 years. So oh, she, had, okay. she had heavy influence and she, again, shedding light on what was happening to the Negro in the U.S. And okay. helping to, again, not, not stop it because, it, you know, it's debatable what, whether it has been stopped, but it was greatly reduced as a result of her efforts. Okay. Okay. Now, well, okay. Just a few more here. How about this? So as a result of her writing these articles, things did happen, you know, because that's, that was, that was the whole, um, the whole premise behind the marches and, and the nonviolence with Dr. King and so on and so forth, it brought attention across America mm -hmm. of what was going on. And some conscious people in other places said, hold on, that's not right. Uh, you know, without her, it would have been kept in the dark, so on and so forth. Right. So that, that was also the, the beauty of what she had done. Right. And so, you know, the evolution of media, you know, so, she writing articles and again, people as the media right now, it's still controlled by a handful of sources. But back then you had a lot more sort different sources and she was a, a prominently known journalist. And so people read about her and, and believe what she said. Um, so the marches, again, uh, she met with President William McKinley, late 1800s, 1898, to talk about making lynching a federal crime. Okay, I love it. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, sig significance of that. So lynching is still not a federal crime. I went to the U.S. Senate. Um, they did an apology, issued an apology um, to America for never passing anti-lynching legislation. And so, of course, the way for something to become a law, it has to go through the House and then the Senate or vice yeah. versa. So three times in the 20th century, it went, got passed through the House and then the Senate did not pass it. And the significance of that is you say, what's the difference? Lynchings, lynchings, murders, murder. So lynching is murder. Is that murder is investigated locally, right? And so if I'm the sheriff and my fishing buddy or my cousin or my brother um, lynched somebody, guess what? He's not going to jail. So literally yeah. out of the 5,000, there's probably at least five times that. Out of the 5,000 or so documented lynchings, very few, if anybody, very few people, if anybody went to jail. 
And so to have oh, that yeah. be a federal crime and you get, uh, you know, their justice is served and you go to jail for lynching somebody, there may not have been as many. But if, if you know, hey, I can kill a Negro yeah, and nothing's yeah. going to happen. Well, what the, who was uh, somebody like her um, uh, during that time frame, understandably, who was her running buddies? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Who would she hang out with that was also in the movement doing things like her that they would converse or whatever? So I'd say that she had colleagues, not running buddies. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, Ida was... Um, Ida was uncompromising. So she was, um, consider, you know, she and Frederick Douglass, um, he was kind of her mentor, if you will. Um, okay. You know, they, they, but they were, uh, um, although they, they were friends, they had their differences. So one of them being for the World's Fair, 1893, why she came to Chicago, um, there were no American Negroes as part of it. There was one um, Negro faction from Haiti. And so Ida wanted to boycott. And Frederick was like, no, we shouldn't boycott. And the analogy that I've heard is that Frederick Douglass's mentality was, if you owe me a loaf of bread and you give me half a loaf, that's progress. And Ida's mentality was, if you owe me a loaf of bread and you give me half a loaf, I need mother half a loaf. I don't care about progress. I want what I'm entitled to. And so if you look at any I got you. Any colleagues during civil rights movements, you've, you've got Malcolm and Martin, you've got Ida Fred, and Marcus Garvey saying, let's go to Africa. So you had different philosophies. Um, so she, she was contemporaries with um, Marcus Garvey, W.B. Du Bois. Um, so, so on the suffrage movement, Susan B. Anthony, um, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who they okay, were. I got you. So again, so she wasn't necessarily friends with them because they, they were they were about women's rights, but they were about white women's rights. But Ida was like, well, I'll fight with them because, hey, if they can get it, then we can get it. So she, she, she fought that fight. Now, I would say she was, I guess, friends with um, Jane Addams um, and a few other people. So she had friends, but as far as um, the, a dynamic duo or some, some running buddies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 Frederick was was of that time frame. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Did 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 uh, for her being a woman that had another dynamic too because men really wasn't giving them the respect. Oh, she was an absolute double minority, uh, double disrespect. She was black and she was a female, and so you know women were you know and again I, I mean this from the historical standpoint considered second class citizens considered hey you know don't don't you know you. You just like children, you say you should be seen and not heard. Yeah. To a degree, we're like that during that time frame. So for her to have the gumption to be so outspoken and so adamant about being heard and telling her story and, and equally important, the story of others is absolutely amazing. It's like, where, where do you get that from? There, there, there was not much of a role model for her. As yeah, far as yeah. Did, was there, did she ever start an organization of something? Uh... Yeah, she started several. Um, too, many to, too, too many to name. I mean, yeah. so... Chicago, she was responsible for starting the, the first black kindergarten. Um, we, we didn't have a black kindergarten, so she started that. She started the Women's Suffrage Club, the Negro Fellowship League. Um, the Women's uh, Suffrage Club, I've heard of that. Yeah, so she, she started a number of organizations. And some of her travels to Europe influenced, she saw the way that they organized, because they, they were fighting for women's rights over there as well. And so some of their suffrage uh, movement um, things that she, she saw them do over there um, influenced her and, and she was able to bring some of those things back in addition to things that she just did naturally. So, right. Um, well, was she a part of, uh, and I know she was married to the, to had a rich husband, lawyer, what have you, but, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm sure that the answer is yes to this question, but was she a part of Chicago's, uh, elite society per se, the rich people, did, did she have money? Did they have a big, beautiful home, that kind of thing? So, I mean, they, 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 they did, or I'd, I'd say they were probably middle class, upper middle class. They, they were not elite. And Ida, so that's the, their socioeconomic status, if you will. Ida's mentality was, I'm Ida. I'm, you know, so I'm not elite. Again, I'm not better than anybody. So she would go to the jail and, and Joliet jail and talk to the inmates. Um, she, you know, saw that, that, that there were very few resources for Black men. That's why she started the Negro Fellowship League. Um, so she was all about bettering people. Um, okay, I got passion you. for bettering black people. So um, socioeconomically, I'd say they were middle class, maybe upper middle. 
but yeah. as far as status, she would not consider herself elite. She 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 was willing to be street. Was she a sharp dresser or any of that she kind was, of thing? She, yes. Now she was an elegant woman. She was she was distinguished and <laughs> admittedly liked liked to shop as well. So spent <laughs> spent spent a little bit of money on clothes as well, but a very dignified, distinguished lady. Was she light skin or dark skin? She was uh, fair skin. Brown skin. Yeah, that's the picture of her right there. She's about my complexion. Yeah. So, because yeah. you know, there's a light skin, dark skin dynamic. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, no, so she was um, about my complexion. Ferdinand, her husband, was probably a shade darker or so. Oh, really? Mm hmm. Yeah. So, did, did she happen to, uh, uh, what did she do for hobbies and that kind of thing? How, how did she pass the time? That you know of, that she enjoyed. Did she knit? Did she a great cook? You know what I mean? Right. To my knowledge, no. Um, I mean, so she was so busy just between writing and organizing, um, and doing speeches and traveling. Um, she was she was, um, a, a, you know, a, a devout Catholic, so she um, a, a Christian, so she supposedly carried a Bible with her, um, attended church regularly, so. I'd say that that was that was most of her free time. But yeah, she spent most of her time um, between being a journalist and being an, an advocate or activist. Okay, I, I got to ask you this one. This, this just just because did she did she face some controversy at some point, even from the black community? Did did they oh, yeah. try, you know, or the white oh, people yeah, yeah. try to do something to her to put her in jail? Or did you know? Did she face anything? To my knowledge, not put her in jail, but to you know, to say put her in her place or disrespect her. And there's a a few incidents um, where some uh, man, I can't remember which state it was, but um, she bottom line went there and with a couple of her friends, male friends, and had the guy publicly apologize for lying about her. Um, Hold on, now what happened now? What did you say? So um, There was an incident where he, he, he said some disparaging comments and essentially lied about Ida. And she was like, ah, like I didn't do that. So you, you can't disparage my name like that. So yeah, and yeah. It, it made the news, it made the media, that kind of thing. Well, to my knowledge, it didn't make the media, but she did write it in her journal um, that that she did that. And I, I think uh, you know, when you're writing your journal, there there may be some embellishment. But I, yeah, I, I yeah, think you're gonna I, have I, I some hater. You know what right. I mean? You yeah. know, you're doing all these. Oh, good yeah, I mean, so she, she did have haters. Um, again, some funders. So for. Her first trip to um, Europe, she had um, funded. Her second trip, she was trying to raise funds. And a woman was like, hey, well, look, I need you to talk bad about that woman over there or, you know, disrupt your affiliation with her and I'll give you the money. And I was like, no, I can't do that. That's that's my friend. And that's oh, really? Right. And I, the lady was like, okay, I'm not giving you money. She said, keep your money and I'll keep, I'll keep, my, I'll keep my integrity. So, yeah, and I tell people, um, you know, I, I talk about leadership development and so forth and a lot of people think that during any civil rights movement or, or leaders always have support. And it's quite the opposite. It yeah, exactly. A, a key part of leadership is being able to stand on your own and stand for your beliefs and your values. Yeah, yeah. Ignore what other people are doing. And then eventually people may fall in line, but don't think that you're going to say something. And there's going to be a war and you say, okay, let's go. You're right. No, it doesn't happen like that. So. Yeah, that's, that's that's what led to that question. I mean, Dr. King, there were places that people said, we don't want you coming here, oh, man. Absolutely. We, we we like the status quo as it is. You come here and you're going to start that's saying things and disrupting it. And all of a sudden, they're going to look at it. And when you leave, we got to live with this. Right. Yeah, we, right. We, don't, we don't want this. What, let me uh, just, uh, what were some of the accolades uh, I, that that have happened a, a, to her, even in 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 her in her passing, such as historical markers, schools. Yeah, hey, brother Anthony, it's been a lot that's happened in the past oh ten years, especially the past five. So you know, America. So American history. You know, that's what I said. When if you write your own history, you, you kind of want to leave the bad stuff out. And so you've got you know white males who've been had been writing American history. That's why. The civil rights movement is from what, 54 to 68. Right. Yes. It was way before then. It is going on right now. But they yeah. trying to encapsulate like that because you don't want to talk about the bad stuff. Right. Um, and so right now she's getting more notoriety because we're bringing up some bad things and having open honest dialogue about so many things that happened in America. Um, so, again, her being a crusader against uh, against lynching, we got to talk about lynching. 
Right. So they, people didn't want to talk about that, but now people are, 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 are being more enlightened about it. So um, in Chicago, there's been a major street renaming, probably the busiest street in the city, um, which happened as a result of another street that had an Italian name and the Italian American community in Chicago was like, no, we want to keep this name. So they look for another street and it's like, oh, you know what? It's called Congress Parkway. So it's not going to offend anybody by changing the name. And it's, it runs throughout the city, but the major thoroughfare is about a mile or so, which leads from the major expressway into a street that leads into downtown and into Grant Park. Okay. That was renamed uh, three years ago. Um, there's been a couple of markers, uh, a monument, which is uh, supposedly the second biggest monument to a woman um, in the country. Um, it just uh, happened last year. Um, or um, um, sorry, uh, this, this past June. So it was finished last year, but we delayed the unveiling because of COVID. Yeah. So that ceremony was in June of this year. Um, there's uh, a statue, life-size statue in Memphis that they just erected in July of this year. Um, and that's the first of, a, there's a park by Bill Street, right off of Bill Street, right off of the major thoroughfare in Memphis. There's a park, so they did the statue and that's part of a, like a five year um, project that they're gonna do to honor Ida and, and what she did. Right. Um, school in DC, some other schools, um, here in, uh, school here in Chicago, school out in Portland, Oregon, just renamed their school from Woodrow Wilson to Ida B. Wells. Again, America's, you know, looking at some of the, our, our, our monuments, our markers, our, our buildings and so forth, and like, okay, th some of them are named after racist people. And we're having open dialogue about that and saying, yeah, this needs to change. And especially when it comes to, I mean, that's the first street in Chicago that's named after after an African American woman. So when you yeah. think about street namings, most of America was built, you know, during the when white men were doing everything. Yeah, so sure. that's what they're gonna name streets after. And it's like, wait a minute, let's let's look at other people who really contributed significantly to America and start to name things after them. And so it's uh, heartwarming, encouraging that they're doing it. And it, it just so happens that Ida B. Wells who I'm related to is, is one of those people that, that they're choosing to. I, I love it. So I guess this is a, let's say my closing question. Sure. When, when you, when you sum it up, what would you sum up her as, uh, uh you know, I mean, as uh, uh, what was her mark on America? Let's say. I'd say that the, the, the driving force behind what she did is she wanted equality for everybody. And so um, some things that she did. So she, uh, sued, she she was forcibly removed from a Tennessee rail car in 1884 and sued the Tennessee Railroad and won. It was overturned. Really? It over, so uh, 70 years before Rosa Parks, Ida did it. Um, and, and, and won. It was overturned by the higher courts later on. Instead of winning $500, she had to pay $200. Um, but again, she was all about, you know, equality. So her, her upbringing and, you know, me mentioning a few things that her parents did and their values, that's what she learned. And she's like, you know, no, I'm, I'm a distinguished woman and other people are distinguished. And she treated everybody with respect and equality. So it wasn't like, again, to your question about being elite, opposite of that. She, she wanted equality, equal access for everybody. So that was her driving force. So there are titles that are associated with that. You know, teacher, she valued education. Um, activist, you know, that's for civil rights suffragists that's for women's rights but that's about everybody uh, having rights but um she wanted equality for everybody so i would say that's that's what sums her up i love it and, and um just brave courageous co uh co courageous beyond my imagination and uh when i think about things that i'm fearful or concerned about doing i get embarrassed i'm like ida would not give a damn about this and she would do it so you know Come on, man. Do you, do you, uh, do you still have uh, in your family? I know you mentioned a lot of things were donated, but are there anything? I know I see the photo behind you, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, a dress or a book, a hat, or something like that that you all have in the family. No, the only thing that um, somebody has at this point would be my aunt, um, who was her um, Ida's uh, granddaughter, has a, a tea set, but I think they we even gave half of that to a couple of museums, but she does have a, a few of those. But outside of that, um, with, and I agree with the decision is to, you know, instead of having it in the family to, you know, allow the world to enjoy it as well. Uh, and, and, and the book she wrote, that is that still where people can get yes, a copy? So, yeah, so what she did was she, she kept her own journal, um, which again, I thought was amazing foresight. She 
um, did not finish it. So her daughter, Alfreda, who's my grandmother, is the one who finished it and got it published. Okay. And so this is the autobiography. Okay. Crusade for Justice. Um, again, edited by Al Alfreda Duster, but this is the autobiography. I love it. Okay. So it just got uh, reprinted um, last year. And so my sister actually wrote a foreword for it. And my uncle, um, who's um, Ida's grandson, my, uh, Troy Duster, wrote the um, afterward. Okay. This is Ida from Abroad. So these books are by my, si my sister did these three. So Ida from Abroad which is um, talking about her travels to Europe. Yeah, I love it. That's and, Sharp Hack. Mm -hmm, yeah, so like I said, she, she was a distinguished woman. Yeah. And then Ida in her own words, which talks about the um, the World Fair here in Chicago in 1893. I got you. And then, which was released earlier this, and so these were released, uh, oh, what, I think seven and 10 years ago. <clears throat> and then Ida Be the Queen, Okay. Just released. Um, and again, that's by my sister, Michelle Duster. Yeah, hey, I love it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I love it. Is there, a, uh, is there a website that you all control? Yeah. For, so it's, of why to be this, so we can put that in the description if people want to go there to do whatever you want them to do. Yeah. So it's, um, it's ibwfoundation.org. Okay. So okay. for, for Ida B. Wells Foundation. So IBWfoundation.org. Okay. And 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 do y'all have a, 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 some celebration of her birthday or any of that kind of thing that, you know, you have a big dinner or dance, you know, whatever, whatever. Yeah. So um, Holly Springs, Mississippi, again, where she was from, has done a celebration for over 30 years now. And we've oh, just really? And so we go there, that's on or around her birthday, which is July 16th. So that's every year we, we drive down for that. Um, so it's about, from Chicago, it's about a nine hour drive. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, and sure. so we do that um, and they, they have a celebration there with, uh, they, they usually have activity. And so the, there's a museum, which is uh, the house that she used to live in, um, is now the ID, is, is now the ID oh, B. Wells okay. Museum. Okay, okay. So, and it's, it's not the, the it's the Ida B. Wells Museum, but it's not limited to Ida B. Wells. So there's some other things in place. Yeah, history. sure, sure. <clears throat> well, so, well, I got uh, the question keep coming up. How did she pass? Um, how old was she? She was uh, 69 when she passed, and she passed from um, essentially a liver disease. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, hey, everybody, this is, man, I told, <laughs> did I tell y'all people? <laughs> I told you. And I, I, I popped them questions out of my man was on it too, wasn't he? I, I, I tried to come up with some questions and my man, he, we got the books and everything and support <laughs> them books, read them books, do that. Support that foundation, support this, uh, learn, tell people about Ida B. Wells. I had heard of it. I mean, she comes up in, you know, when you in grade schools and, and I'm in Detroit. So, you know, we talk black history here, you know. And so I had heard her name. Uh, among the greats, um, and but I, I ain't gonna lie to you. I just didn't know what the connection was. I know now, you and connected me <laughs> on the connection of her greatness. I knew there was some, and you know I didn't read it about it, but now I know. Everybody hit the subscribe button. I keep giving it to you straight, no chaser. That's what my man did. Put a little ice cube in it, a little lemon or something like that. But we give it to you to intoxicate your mind. Like this video, if you don't like no other video on the channel, because I got it straight, for lack of a better way of putting it. I shouldn't say it, but I will. Hope you don't get mad from the horse's mouth, because <laughs> my man told it like he did. Good guy. Uh, uh, hit the bell when the videos come out. Tell somebody about Strong Inspiration. Support uh, in, the, in the credits, and in, in the description would be the uh, website and all that other good stuff, names of the books. Put that down. Tell your family. I said thank you for 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 being who they are, keeping it going, uh, and 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 you coming on the channel, my man. I, I really like that. Thank you again. And so I say this with all sincerity, with all sincerity. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind, doing the great things you doing. We just didn't have time to talk about it. <laughs> That's all. That's another channel because I know my man tight. That's it. it down. 
Brother Anthony, hey, we, we, are, we are connected. I, I thank you for having me on your show. You More got it. I thank you for what you do day in, day out to enlighten our brothers and sisters across the globe. Uh, I, I, and you helped me do it just, just now. Thank you so much for that. And with that, I'll say bye-bye. We out. Truly an inspiration, brother. Stay strong. Please. Yes. Stay strong. I like All that. Right.